السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن صار على سبيله ونهجه واستنى بسنته وقتفى أثره بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد عن أبي أبد الرحمن عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله تعالى عن حدثنا عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو صادق المصدوق إن أحدكم يجمع خلقه في بطن أمه أربعين يوما ثم يكون علقة مثل ذلك ثم يكون مضغة مثل ذلك فيرسل إليه الملك فينفخ فيه الروح ويؤمر بأربع كلمات بكتب رزق وأجل وعمل وشقي وسعيد وشقي أو سعيد فوالذي لا إله غيره إن أحدكم لا يعمل بعمل أهل الجنة حتى ما يكون بينه وبينها إلا ذراع فيسبق عليه الكتاب فيعمل بعمل أهل النار فيدخلها وإن أحدكم لا يعمل بعمل أهل النار حتى ما يكون بينه وبينها إلا ذراع فيسبق عليه الكتاب فيعمل بعمل أهل الجنة فيدخلها متفق عليه This hadith which I narrated to you is collected within the Sahih of Bukhari and Imam Muslim which means that it is or it has the greatest level of authenticity but before I go into this hadith I just wanted to inshallah ta'ala to invite all of the brothers who are attending the, today's lesson, today's lecture to inshallah ta'ala to move closer inshallah if you can just fill in all the gaps the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam once was delivering a dars, a talk in the masjid and he was educating the companions radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een and three men they entered into the masjid three people the first one he came in and he found a space in the front and he went to the front and he sat down and as for the second individual they stayed at the back they didn't come forward they didn't sit down they just remained at the back and as for the third individual they saw that the gathering was full and so they left the gathering the prophet وسلم, after delivering his talk after educating and delivering his reminder to the companions radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in he said ala ukhbirukum anin nafari thalatha shall I inform you of these three individuals who entered into the masjid and so the companions they said yes O messenger of Allah and so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said amma ahaduhuma as for the first individual fa'awa ila Allah fa'awahu Allah as for the first individual who entered into the masjid and he came to the front and he found a space in the front of the gathering, then he turned to Allah, so Allah turned towards him. He turned to Allah, so Allah turned towards him in goodness. And as for the second individual, the second individual who stayed at the back, they didn't look for a seat, they didn't look for a place to sit down and benefit from the wise words of the Prophet The Prophet said that individual was shy, so Allah was shy of them. And as for the third and final individual out of these three men, The Prophet he said, as for the third individual, that the third individual who came to the gathering with his two brothers, those two other men that came, instead of going forward and finding a space like the first individual, or even just waiting at the back, this individual, they left the gathering. And so the Prophet ﷺ said regarding this third individual, they turned away, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned away from them. And this hadith, it highlights the importance and some of the etiquettes when it comes to studying this religion. When it comes to attending the gatherings of knowledge and the classes of knowledge in which we mention the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we mention the ahadith of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are etiquettes that every single one of us we need to come with, that we need to display. 
because this knowledge that we're learning it's not Shakespeare or Charles Dickens but rather this knowledge has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from above the seven heavens so it is imperative that every single one of us that when we come to learn about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we do so with etiquettes and from the first and foremost etiquettes that we have is that we come close together and we close all the gaps that are there so inshallah ta'ala so as to benefit Barakallahu feek. So as to benefit inshallah ta'ala from the knowledge that bi'idhnillah ta'ala will be discussed and conveyed. Last week we begun this series of lectures which is entitled A Journey Through to the Hereafter. Rihla ila al-akhirah. A Journey Through to the Hereafter and we gave an introduction, a muqaddimah into the topic or into what the series of lectures will go through and what we will discuss bi'idhnillah ta'ala. And last week's introduction wasn't too long. But we gave an introduction, a brief summary as to what would be covered bi'idhnillahi ta'ala in the upcoming few lectures or in the upcoming few classes. But before we even go into the hereafter, the akhirah, and the afterlife, what a person goes through after they pass away and they leave this dunya and the various stages of the hereafter, it is important to discuss the life of this dunya. Because an individual in this that has been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, an individual, a human being who has been created by Allah, which is every single one of us, and every single person who came before us, and every single person who will, who will walk upon the face of this earth after us, they are all the creation of Allah. And so all of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they go through four stages. Four stages, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He discusses these stages, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they discuss these stages within the Sharia. And in fact, if you want to add another stage, you can even add a fifth stage as well. But there are four main stages. The first is the life or the time that you spend in the womb of your mother. This is the first stage. And the hadith that we're going to discuss, it mentions or it discusses this topic. Number two is the life of this dunya when me and you are living we're walking we're eating we're drinking we're breathing this is another stage the third stage in which every single human being will go through is the life of the grave when we pass away before we even meet allah before we even reach the different stages on yawm al qiyamah before yawm al qiyamah is established there is that period of time in which we will spend in the grave that is the third stage and the fourth stage is yawm al qiyamah the final abode, the hereafter. The fifth stage which I was referring to comes before all of this. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions within the Qur'an, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ And remember when we took out from the loins of your forefather, Adam alayhi salatu was salam, all of creation, everyone who is going to come upon the face of this dunya, we took them all out and we asked them, Allah questioned us. We were all there and the scholars of, uh, the scholars of Islam, they say that where were we? We were on the plains of Arafah. The Hajj that is coming up, one of the pillars of Hajj is Arafah. The standing on the plains of Arafah is from the pillars of Hajj. If a person doesn't stand on the plain of Arafah, the Hajj is invalid. So, the scholars, they say that this verse in Surah Al-A'raf refers to our presentation in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We were all present in front of Allah, but Allah caused us to forget this incident before we even entered into the wombs of our mothers, before Allah even brought us into this dunya. So Allah says that He took every single child of Adam out of the loins of our forefather Adam alayhi salatu was salam and he said to every single one of us alastu bi rabbikum am i not your lord and we said qalu bala shahidna an taqulu yawm al qiyamati inna kunna an hadha ghafilin and we all said yes oh allah verily you are our lord and why does allah mention this incident in the quran allah says lest you come on yawm al qiyam and say oh allah we were heedless of this we didn't know that we had to worship you. We didn't know that there was going to come a time in which you're going to hold us to account. We never knew that there's an afterlife. And in the hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam collected within the Musnad Imam Ahmed. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, verily before Allah created all of creation, Allah looked at all of the hearts of creation. My heart, your heart, the hearts of every single creation. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala found the most purest of hearts to be 
the heart of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and hence he was chosen to be the Messenger of Allah. And then the hadith continues, the next best set of hearts that were chosen and selected after the heart of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was or were the hearts of the companions radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een who would support the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in aiding and strengthening the message of Islam. So this is one of the stages if you like. The other stages, the four that I've mentioned, in the womb of your mother, in the dunya, in the grave, and in the hereafter, these are four stages ta'ala we will be going through. So this hadith which I narrated to you is a quite lengthy hadith. And it is a hadith which Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, as we mentioned, they collected within the Sahihain. And it is hadith number four of Arba'in al-Nabawi. Remember, Nabawi he has a collection of a hadith, 40 a hadith, Arba'in al Nabawi, in which he collects a number of a hadith. And those a hadith, he has different topics as to why he chooses certain a hadith. But this hadith, it discusses a person in the womb of their mother, what happens, and then when they come to this dunya, and then what happens to them. And it's a quite lengthy hadith, bi ta'ala, which we will discuss. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created the human being. Because before we can even tread upon the akhirah, the hereafter, we need to know that there are certain things and certain signs which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He placed in this dunya. Before we even reach the akhirah. For example, our creation, my creation, your creation, when Allah created us, that is a sign from the signs of Allah. Another example are the signs of Yawmul Qiyamah. We're speaking about the hereafter and the different stages of the hereafter. Does not Allah give us signs in this dunya? There are signs that are going to come that are there to warn you that Yawmul Qiyamah is drawing near. So before we can even enter into the realms of the Akhirah, the hereafter, we need to first discuss those signs and those issues pertaining to this dunya. And this is what this hadith covers. But even before we begin speaking about this hadith and speaking about the creation of the human being, there are a number of important things that we need to discuss because the human being wasn't the first thing to be created. The human being wasn't the first thing to be created. But rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we find in the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said Allah created four things with his own hands. Four things were created by the two hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by himself. And when we say the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hands of Allah unlike our hands, but rather the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said Allah has two hands and both of the hands of Allah are right. They are right. Okay? So for a person to come and try to imagine and try to fathom and try to comprehend and understand, they will fall into misguidance. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Allah has two hands and both of those hands are right, we stop there. You don't go any further. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created four things with His own two hands. What are they? Number one is the throne. Number two is the pen. Number three is the garden of paradise. And number four was Adam alayhi salatu was salam. The scholars, they looked at this hadith and they looked at other hadith as well and they said, what was the first thing Allah created? What was the first thing that Allah created? And they came to the conclusion that the first thing that Allah created because of other supporting a hadith was that Allah created the throne. His throne was the first thing to be created. And His throne was above water. As Allah says in the Quran, وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامِ وَكَانَ عَرْشُهُ عَلَى الْمَاءِ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا And it is He, Allah, who created the heavens and the earth in six days or six periods. أيام ستة أيام وكان عرشه على الماء And His throne is above the water. So that He may test you who is excellent in performing good deeds. So the throne was the first thing to be created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we know from the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma that it is from those four things that Allah created with his own two hands. So Allah created his throne. Allah created the pen. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created the garden of paradise. And Allah created Adam alayhi salatu was salam with his own two hands. And as for the rest of the creation, he said, be, and it became. Kun fayakun. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created the pen, he commanded the pen to write. To write what? To write decree. To write everything that would take place. And this hadith, this long hadith that I've narrated to you at the beginning of today's class or today's lecture, also discusses this topic as well of decree. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from these four things that he created was paradise. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, wala khatara ala qalbi bashar, and no heart of any human being, male or female, has ever been able to comprehend. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, when he speaks about the different delights of Jannah and Paradise, they are there just so to motivate us, so that we can earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But no one will ever be able to comprehend whilst living and breathing upon the face of this dunya, the true extent and the true reality of the various delights in Jannah. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about the fruits in Jannah, these aren't fruits that you buy from Tesco or Asda, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks about the relationships in Jannah, how people will have spouses in Jannah, husbands and wives. When Allah says, or when the Prophet spoke about how their beauty will increase every time they leave their families and they come back. This is something which we can only understand to a certain extent because our minds are limited. When Allah speaks about the palaces in Jannah, or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in his sunnah, sunnah speaks about the palaces in Jannah, it is only to some extent that we can comprehend and understand. Because paradise is something, as the Prophet ﷺ said, no eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, on what no human being has been able to comprehend with their heart. Paradise, Jannah, from the four things which Allah created with His own two hands. And last but not least, number four, was Adam والسلام, our father. The fourth thing that Allah created with his own two hands was Adam alayhi salatu was salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions this within the Qur'an. When he speaks about the story of Adam alayhi salatu was salam and Iblis. When Iblis, he refused and he disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he refused to prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of arrogance. Not because he disbelieved in Allah, not because he was an atheist, not because he had some questions or doubts about the angels, he was from the company of the angels, but rather out of arrogance. You created me, O oh Allah, from fire, and you created him from clay. And according to the logic of Shaytan Iblis, clay is better or superior, sorry, fire is superior than clay. And so he was arrogant outward rightly. And so he refused to prostrate to Adam alayhi salatu was salam. And Allah says in the Quran, what prevented you, O Iblis, from prostrating to Adam that which I created with my own two hands? Khalaqtahu biyadayh. I created with my own two hands. So Adam alayhi salatu was salam was from those four things which Allah created with his own two hands. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, another hadith mentions that he blew, Allah blew his spirit into Adam alayhi salatu was salam. And many people, when they read this hadith, they become amazed and they misunderstand this hadith. How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blow his spirit into Adam alayhi salatu was salam? Does that mean that in Adam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a part of himself to Adam alayhi salatu was salam? Hasha lillah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not within his creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his creation. What this hadith means, or what this hadith denotes, is an honor for the child of Adam. Meaning when Allah, or the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah blew his spirit into Adam alayhi salatu was salam, that spirit belonged to Allah. So if we say the kitabullah, we don't say Allah is in the book, we say kitabullah, the Quran is the book of Allah. Why? We connect it to Allah to show its honor. The masjid is Baytullah. So the house of Allah. So does Allah live in the house? No. It's a connotation or it denotes honor. Whenever we connect something to Allah, it denotes honor. So when we say Ruhullah, the spirit of Allah was 
entered into Adam or blown into Adam alayhi salatu was salam, what do we mean? Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, they say it means honor. How Allah gave a spirit to Adam alayhi salatu was salam. Not literally from Allah to Adam alayhi salatu was salam. Because this would mean or this would imply kufr, disbelief. And many of the deviant groups, they fell astray with issues like this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created these four things with his own two hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about the creation of Adam alayhi salatu was salam in the Quran and how he was the first human being to live upon the face of this earth. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he commanded Iblis to prostrate and Iblis refused. The story is well known, I'm sure. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in different places within the Quran. And then from Iblis, uh, then from Adam alayhi salatu was salam, Allah created his spouse, Hawa alayhi salatu was salam, from his rib. And Allah mentions this in the Quran too. So the story of the first human being to be created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is known. But the hadith that we're going to discuss today or the topic of discussion in today's lecture is on the creation of the human being in general. Because before we enter into the realms of the Akhirah, we need to know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He placed us upon this dunya. So the hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an, he is from the illustrious companions, the companions who specialized in the Quran. The companions, they all had different specialities, they all were good at different things. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, some were good at military tactics, others were good at the Quran, others were good in the science of fiqh, others were good in business, they were entrepreneurs, businessmen. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, his speciality was the Quran. So he was a scholar of the Quran. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, his virtues are many. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he said to all the companions, if you wish to learn the Quran, then learn it from who? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And when the companions saw the shins of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud because of how thin they were, they laughed. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he rebuked them. And he said, do you laugh at the shins of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud? Verily they are more weighty in the sight of Allah than the mountain of Uhud. And so his virtues are many. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was from the senior companions. He wasn't like the young companions, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al-As. Uh, he wasn't like these young companions, but rather he was from the senior companions. He narrates this hadith, and he said, The Prophet wasallam he informed me. But before he goes into the hadith, he, mentioned this, uh, he mentions a description of the Prophet wasallam wa huwa sadiq al-masduq, and he is the truthful of the truthful. Meaning, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he's going to say now, the hadith, because these aren't issues pertaining to halal and haram. If I do this, does my wudu break? If I do this, do I have to make a sajdu sahu at the end of the prayer? No, because what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is going to narrate from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is an issue pertaining to the hereafter. And when it comes to issues of the hereafter, then there is no qiyas, there is no analogy, there is no ijtihad if you like coming to a conclusion because everything has to be clear cut and so when it comes to the affairs of the akhirah these are issues which people haven't seen people haven't seen and that's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he speaks about the believers in the Quran at the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah how does he describe them الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ and they are those the believers who they believe in the unseen. They believe in the unseen. We believe in Yawmul Qiyamah even though it hasn't been established within our lives. We believe that there will be the scales that will be brought forth that will judge between us. Yet we've never seen those scales. We believe in angels yet we've never seen a single angel in our life. We believe in these things from the unseen. Why? Because that is from the characteristics or those are from the characteristics of the believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, He says they are those who believe in the unseen and they establish the prayer and they spend from what we have given to them. So when it comes to speaking about the affairs of the hereafter, the akhirah, then it is imperative that whatever we narrate has to be authentic. It has to be authentic and the scholars from amongst the companions would rarely differ 
they would really differ on these sorts of issues because these are issues which require certainty. These aren't issues of ijtihad where one imam will say or one companion will say this and another companion will hold a different opinion and another companion will hold a different opinion. No. Very few issues in aqeedah pertaining to the hereafter are disputed amongst the companions. Very few. You can perhaps even count them on your fingers because these are issues which have been narrated by the Prophet So when the Prophet narrates these incidents to us, they are true. Unfortunately, we live in a time in which it's extremely difficult to hold on to a set of beliefs. When we have different ideologies being pushed, modernism, communism, feminism, all of these isms that are being pushed, the whole objective is to chip away at a person's aqeedah, atheism, agnosticism, and so to hold on to a set of beliefs is extremely difficult in our society. And so the believer is the one they believe in what the Prophet ﷺ came with. They believe in what Allah revealed in the Quran because it hasn't been changed. It's unaltered. And so even though we haven't seen Allah, even though we haven't seen the angels and we haven't seen the jinn, we still believe in all of that. That is a core tenant of our faith, a pillar from the pillars of Iman. And so he says, وَهُوَ صَادِقُ الْمَصْدُوقِ And he is, the most, he is the truthful out of the most truthful amongst the human beings. And so this statement of his is also supported by verses of the Qur'an. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he speaks in the Qur'an and he speaks about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that verily our Prophet when he speaks and he narrates, he doesn't speak from his own whims or desires. Because the kuffar of Quraysh, they would come and they would say, they would be companions who would write down. They were literate. They were able to write down a hadith for those companions who weren't able to memorize. Majority of them perhaps were illiterate, but there were few who would be able to write down. And so the kuffar of Quraysh, they would rebuke the, those companions, those few who would write. And they would say, do you write everything that comes out of the mouth of this man? He gets angry, he becomes sad, and you write down everything. He's happy sometimes. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he responded to them and he said to those companions who write, write and continue to write for verily nothing comes out of my mouth except the truth. So Allah said in the Quran, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى This man, the Prophet ﷺ, our Prophet, he doesn't speak from his own whims or desires. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوحَى Verily it is revelation from the Most High, from Allah. So the Quran is revelation as well as the sunnah. So we take everything together because there are certain things mentioned in the Quran and there are certain things which aren't mentioned in the Quran but you will find them in the sunnah. And Allah says in another place within the Quran, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in this verse and we reveal to them the reminder. لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ So that it can be made clear to them it is made apparent to them what has been revealed to them so that they may ponder. Revealed in this verse comes twice. So what is the second reference to revelation here? Because we know one of them is the Quran. So what is the other revelation? And we reveal to them the reminder so that they can explain or so he can explain. The Prophet so he can explain what was revealed to them. Revelation is mentioned here twice. Why? Once is for the Sunnah and the second time is for the Quran. Allah revealed the sunnah as revelation, as wahi to the Prophet ﷺ to explain what was revealed to them, i.e. the Qur'an. So when Allah says, aqimu salah establish the prayer. Okay, so where in the Qur'an does it mention that Fajr is two rak'ahs and Dhuhr is four and Asr is four and Maghrib is three and Isha is four? It's not mentioned anywhere. But rather you have to find it within the sunnah. So we take the Qur'an and the sunnah together and the Prophet ﷺ, he warned us, he warned us, a time will come in which people towards the Yawm Al-Qiyamah, they will only say, give us the Qur'an. A man will lie on the sofa and he will say, I only want the Qur'an. Don't give me the Sunnah. I don't want any of these man-made narrations. But we know the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is revelation from Allah, just as Allah revealed the Qur'an. So once that fact is established amongst us, وَهُوَ صَادِقُ الْمَصْدُوقِ He is the tr most truthful out of the human beings who are truthful. He said, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he informed me, إِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ يُجْمَعُ خَلْقُهُ فِي بَطْنِ أُمِّهِ أَرْبَعِينَ يَوْمًا 
Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he wishes to create a human being, he wants to bring someone into this dunya, he gathers them in the womb of their mother for 40 days. For 40 days. ثُمَّ يَكُونُ عَلَقَةً مِثْلَ ذَلِكَ ثُمَّ يَكُونُ مُضْغَةً مِثْلَ ذَلِكَ and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he spoke about the cycle of the embryo and how Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala after in that 40 day period, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala after that 40 day period makes this individual like a clinging clot, a clinging clot. And thereafter, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, he transforms that clinging clot into a fetus and a person begins to have or form or they begin to show the shape and the size of a human being. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sends an angel. He sends an angel to that individual. And that angel it blows the spirit into that human being. Subhanallah, this is all happening within the womb of a mother, of a woman. So the Prophet ﷺ said, ثُمَّ يُرْسَلُوا ثُمَّ يُرْسَلُوا الْمَلَكِ That Allah has sent an angel, فَيَنْفُخُ فِيهِ الرُّوحِ And the angel has blown the spirit into that human being, to make it into a human being, to give it life, into that creation of Allah. وَيُؤْمَرُ بِأَرْبَعِ كَلِمَاتِ And that angel is tasked or commissioned to establish four things bikatbi rizqi wa ajali wa amali wa shaqiyun aw sa'id four things have to be established for this individual number 1 is their provision their livelihood their provision is established by that angel wa ajali and their lifespan how long will they live allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is already decreeing even before you come into this dunya how long you will live upon the face of this dunya Number three, وَعَمَلِي And their deeds, their good deeds. And number four, whether they would be شَقِيٌّ أو سعيد, Whether they will be from the good doers or from those who are wretched. So these four things are established by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By the angel before a person even comes out of the womb of their mothers to actually live upon the face of this earth. These are all predestined and decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, فَوَالَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ غَيْرُ And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took an oath by Allah. There is no other deity apart from Allah. Verily a person, إِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ لَيَعْمَلُ بِعَمَلِ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ Verily an individual. They do the actions of the people of paradise. They spend their whole life worshipping Allah and they perform good deeds. They're obedient to their parents. They're good to their spouse. They're good to their husband. They're good to their wife. They worship Allah. They recite the Quran. They don't commit shirk with Allah. They do the actions of the actions of the people of paradise. Until there is between them and paradise an arm span worth of distance meaning a short amount of distance, just a small distance between them and paradise. So paradise is within reachable distance to them, an arm span, which is nothing literally. فَيَسْبِقُ عَلَيْهِ kitab. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, but the book overcomes them. What's the book? The decree of Allah overcomes them. فَيَعْمَلُ بِعَمَلِ أَهْلِ النَّارِ and then at, towards the end of their life, whilst they're so close to Jannah and Paradise, they perform an action from the actions of the people of the fire of hell and they enter into the fire of hell. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, وَإِنَّ أَحَدَكُمْ Verily from amongst you, or from you, لَيَعْمَلُ بِعَمَلِ أَهْلِ النَّارِ is an individual who performs the actions of the people of the fire of hell. All they do is commit sin. For them to do any good doesn't compute within their minds. When, from the moment they wake up till the time that they put their head on their pillow at night, all they've done is disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So they perform the actions and they spend their whole life performing the actions of the people of the fire of hell. Until they reach or a point in which between them and hellfire is an arm span. Again, an arm span, meaning they're so close to fall into the fire of hell. Think about a bank and you have some water there. All you have to do is push that individual to fall inside. That's how close they are to falling into the fire of hell. فَيَسْبِقُ عَلَيْهِ الْكِتَابِ But the book, it overcomes the meaning, the decree of Allah overtakes them and towards the end of their life, they perform the actions of the actions of the people of Jannah. فَيَدْخُلُهَا And they enter into paradise. This is the hadith of our Prophet wasallam that makes up today's class. The scholars of Islam, when they would narrate this hadith, they would cry because they would be worried of how severe and how dangerous they would feel and how unsecure they would feel for themselves that they worship Allah a person can worship Allah and spend their whole life worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right to the end when it matters the most this is when they slip up and so they would become worried and this hadith is also a form of hope for those people who spend their whole life sinning and sinning and sinning and they realize they haven't got much time left just by a single good deed by worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards the end of their life, they enter into paradise because of a few good deeds they performed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ That verily good deeds are based upon their ending. How you end the good deed is what matters, not how you begun it. So from the beginning of the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he spoke about creation. And this happened for every single one of us, that when we were in the wombs of our mothers, an angel came. Allah formed us and Allah shaped us and an angel came and it blew spirit into us which gave us life. And Allah decreed for every single one of us how much we will earn, our livelihood, our provision. So even though you work hard and you hustle and you grind and whatever you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed how much you will earn and how much you will get. Okay? So for those people who look for haram means and think that I have no other option, the angel already came to you when you were in the womb of your mother and Allah decreed it for you. You will not earn a single pound, a single pence more than what Allah has decreed for you. Number one. Number two. Wa ajali, And their lifespan. How long they will live. Did not our Prophet wasallam tell us that the majority of my ummah will live for 60 to 70 years. 60 to 70 years and very few will surpass that uh, age and so Allah he has already decreed how long me how long you how long we will all live for but even before we came into this dunya number three our good deeds how many good deeds we will perform how we will perform them to what ability will we perform them whether we'll be consistent in performing them all of this has already been decreed by Allah and whether we will be from the people who are Saved the people who are good or the people who are wretched. Shaqiyun or Sa'id. The people who are wretched or the people who are good. This hadith it establishes a principle in this religion. And that principle is the foundation of this hadith. Because Imam al Nabawi, when he would bring these 42 hadith in this book, Arba'in al Nabawi, every hadith is based upon a principle. Every hadith makes up a principle of the religion. And the principle of this religion is qada wal qadr, believing in the decree and the predestiny of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some of the scholars they said that this hadith it is a quarter of this religion, a quarter of Islam. So they found four hadith which basically makes up the foundation of Islam, and they said this hadith is hadith number four of Arba'in al Nawawi is one of those four hadith that acts as the foundation of this religion. So the principle here is belief in the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already predestined, has already ordained, has already decreed what will happen. Allah says in the Quran, Inna kulla shay'in khalaqna hu bi qadar. Verily we created everything in decree. Everything has been preordained, everything is destined. Yawmul Qiyamah, when it will be established, how long we will live, who we will marry if we're not married, how many children we'll have, 
when we will pass away, where we will pass away, at what age we'll pass away, who will come after us, whether our lineage after we pass away, two, three generations down the line, whether they'll be Muslim or not. Allah has already decreed all of this. Everything is decreed. The jobs, the careers that we will have, the degree that if we choose to study a degree, what we will achieve, where we will go. Allah has already decreed all of this. Because there are certain groups who have deviated again on this issue of Qadr. They don't believe that everything is decreed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed everything. Because Allah is Al-Hakim. Allah is the All-Wise. an alim the All-Knowledgeable. To such extent that Allah knows that something won't happen. Something is not going to happen. But if it were to happen, what would be the repercussions or what would be the outcome of that incident taking place? Allah has full knowledge of that. So a person asks a question. So then why do I need to work? Why do I need to perform good deeds if it's already been decreed or if it's already been predestined? What's the point of making dua? Number one is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he decreed something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never imposed anything on us. Allah never imposed on us that you should be from the disbelievers, that you should disbelieve in Allah. Allah gave you a choice to believe in Allah or to disbelieve in Allah, to follow Islam or to leave Islam. It is up to you on which choice you want to take. Allah hasn't forced anyone to take a choice or to make a decision. But Allah knows what choice or what decision you will make. That's number one. Number two, there is a hadith of our Prophet ﷺ in which he said, لا يرد القدر إلا الدعاء. Nothing stops decree or predestiny except supplication. So a person comes and they say, what's the point of me making dua to Allah? What's the point of me supplicating to Allah when everything has already been preordained? It's decreed. It's destined. So the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ answers this issue. That nothing will change predestiny. Meaning whatever is supposed to come to you will reach you. Even if it's within the depths of the earth, Allah will bring it to you. And if something is even close to you, between your lips, but it's not supposed to reach you, it will never reach you. Nothing can change decree apart from dua. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said in the hadith that is collected within the Mu'jam of At-Tabarani, that verily when a person makes dua, that dua goes to Qadr. And there is a battle between dua and qadr. And eventually dua overpowers qadr. And so dua has the power to change decree. So never ever take dua for granted. Never think something is impossible. Never think that I'm, un, I'm not able to do this. For verily dua can change your destiny. But Allah knows that that dua will change your destiny or whether it won't. And so dua can change your destiny. We don't know. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows. So we establish a principle that from the beliefs of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah is that we believe that every single thing has been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one. And number two, that supplication dua can alter or change a person's decree, a person's destiny. And the rest of the hadith of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which he speaks about coming close to Jannah and coming close to the fire of hell. Never ever take it for granted that you're a believer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never think that you're safe from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never think that when I pass away, I'm going to enter into my grave. And as soon as I enter into my grave, I'm going to be resurrected. And I'm going to be from the people who will be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And I'm going to enter into paradise. It's going to be a walk in the park. Never have safety or never feel a sense of safety and security for yourself. Because this hadith, it shows the opposite. A person can spend their whole life worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards the end of their life decrees that they perform an action of the people of the fire of hell. And so they disobey Allah. They spend their whole life doing good. But then they leave this religion. And they leave Islam. And they disbelieve and they apostate. Hasha lillah. And then what happens to them? They are from the people who enter into the fire of hell. And that's why the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een, even though Allah had guaranteed for them paradise, they were certified, guaranteed to enter into Jannah. Radiallahu anhum wa radu'an. 
Allah is pleased with them, the companions, and they are pleased with Allah. And Allah has prepared for them gardens in which rivers flow from beneath. Allah mentioned this in the Quran. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Abdullah ibn Abbas. They saw, they, they, they witnessed these ayat being revealed upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even that Bedouin, Arab, who entered into the masjid and urinated in the masjid and accepted Islam because of the soft nature of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is from the people of paradise because he's a companion. Allah is pleased with the companions. There are countless of ayat in the Quran that extol and venerate the virtue of the companions that Allah is pleased with them. Yet, despite them living with the Prophet wasallam, despite them witnessing revelation, because revelation at that time would come at any time. If something happened, revelation would come. So if you are munafiq, if you are a hypocrite at that time, you'd have to watch your back. Because if you plot and plan in the cover of darkness, Allah would expose you by morning. So revelation wasn't something which was easy. So they would witness revelation. They would see the ayat of Allah coming down. They would be living with the Prophet ﷺ. Yet, they would fear for themselves. They would come to the masjid. And when they would come to the masjid, then they would listen to the khutbah al jumuah It wasn't the local imam giving the khutbah. It was the Prophet ﷺ. When they would have a child, their wife would give birth. Who would give the tahniq to put something sweet like a date? in the mouth or the gum of the child, it would be the Prophet wasallam. When there was a dispute or there was an issue that they needed to reconcile in, they would go to who? The Prophet wasallam. So they lived in that era of virtue. They lived in that era of ilm, of knowledge. And the sunnah was widespread. Yet, they still feared for themselves. And people like Umar ta'ala an, he would say that, I don't know if Allah would accept a single good deed of mine. For verily, if Allah accepted just one good deed of mine, if I know that Allah, it's guaranteed mudmin for me, that Allah accepted one good deed of mine, then I would place all of my reliance upon that one single good deed. That's how afraid they were of falling into uh, leaving Islam. That's how afraid they were of leaving, performing good deeds. And then we come today and we're from, we're not from those people who lived during the time of the Prophet wasallam. The Prophet isn't alive now with us. We don't see or we don't witness revelation coming down. Yet we perform one good deed, two good deeds, three good deeds. And we think that Jannah is secured for us. We don't have to wake up for Salatul Fajr tomorrow morning. Because we worshipped Allah today. But the companions would have the opposite mindset. This hadith or the ending of this hadith also gives us a glimpse of hope. And it shows to us that we can never truly judge an individual for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can turn an individual from evil to good. And there are countless narrations in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and there are stories of scholars who would be drunkards, who would be highway robbers and thieves. Yet, when the religion of Allah came to them, when a single verse was recited upon them, that single verse was enough to open their eyes and make them change. So if a person commits and spends their whole life worship, disobeying Allah, they didn't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once. They never ever put their head on the ground for Allah. They don't even know how to perform sajda. Yet, towards the end of their life, Allah wants good for that individual because perhaps they have a sincere heart and they're looking for a way out. Allah blesses them and Allah allows them to perform good deeds like the deeds of the people of paradise. Allah forgives everything and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He accepts their good deeds and He allows them to be from the people of paradise. And that's what our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He told us, which is something which we will discuss inshallah ta'ala in one of the upcoming lectures, that a person will come on yawm al qiyam and all they did was sins. They have 99 files of sins, 99 records. Each of those records is how far the eye can see. That's just one record and they've got 99 of those. So when they put that on a scale, they've got, just got a single good deed to put on the other side of the scale. What is one file compared to 99 evil files going to equate to? And so that one file will overweigh those 99 files of sin, of evil. Why? What is that one file? La ilaha illallah. The tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a person professes the kalima tawheed and they live by tawheed, worshipping Allah, understanding its meaning, this will outweigh all of 
the sins that a person commits. And this will be the gateway, that opportunity for them to receive the intercession of the Prophet wasallam, which is also another station on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he accepts our good deeds, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he makes us from the people of Jannah, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he saves us and our families from the fire of hell. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala in next week's class, next week's lecture inshallah, we're going to look at some of the forthcoming signs, that the next stage which are the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyam and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sends signs to his creation to understand that the hour is drawing near. And just like that inshallah ta'ala we're going to work our way through till we reach the final stage which is the final destination of either paradise or the fire of hell may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the fire of hell and grant us jannah bi idhnillah sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in if there's any questions we can take questions there are no questions so inshallah ta'ala we can conclude here bi Allah. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.